You guys ready? Yeah. Afraid so. Afraid so. One, two, three, four. We met in 1999, the spring of 99, and it was a, a lightning bolt and an accident that basically brought her into my life. I was a songwriter, I have a terrible voice, and I wanted to make this record, and my friend Gary was down with the plan, <laughs> and Steve came along for the ride, and uh, everything was great. We had this great plan to sort of mix American like the history of American music with sort of our own perspective and uh, and our own bent and uh, but we couldn't like I couldn't sing we actually tried a couple versions of these songs with me singing which were I, it really did sound like a combination of Lisa Loeb and Kermit the Frog <laughs> <laughs> and it just didn't work I basically had never um, sung in any way professionally, you know, I, I grown up with, with a family who they sung us to sleep, we would sing in car trips, but it was more of a recreation as opposed to an art form. And in fact, I never thought of it really as an art form, in, I mean, for me, uh, something I should pursue. But I always sort of, I mean, I love singing. And, um, and so I always sort of wanted to find an outlet for singing. It wasn't something I was like, I'm going to start singing. It was literally just something I would try just on the side because I was a television producer at the time for the news for news and that's just not very creative. I had noticed that in the Village Voice there were want ads for musicians and I thought I'll look through there and I found a Village Voice around my house and and just looked through it and saw this ad and it said you know looking for a singer for original songs and I thought okay this is certainly non-committal enough that I think I could fit in here somewhere. Eventually we just pulled the ad because we got too many crazy responses and about two weeks after I pulled the ad I got another crazy response from this woman who said that she wasn't really a singer but she thought that she'd give it a try and I was like, just send me a demo, just I wanted to get her off the phone. And she was like, well I don't have a demo but I have this tape of lullabies that I made for some friends who, who were having babies. And she asked if she could come over and m make a recording of it in my in my house. So she came over and she, she put <laughs> she put the tape in my my tape recorder and I made a high speed dub and I ushered her out the door quickly. Although I thought she was nice enough and she seemed sane. No, you said you thought I was a little weird. <laughs> a little weird. And uh, but I wasn't planning on listening to the tape because I'm a jerk. And eventually, though, I went to play another tape and I pressed the wrong button and her tape came on. The bed is too small for my tired head Bring me a hill soft with trees Tuck a cloud up under my chin Lord, blow the moon out, please And now, it's true, when I do write, I mean, we joke about it, but her voice is the voice that I hear when I write songs, and it's the voice that we all sort of revolve around and we all try to make room for because it's, it's so spectacular. None of us expected this to go beyond the first album. We thought we were making an album that would be an album to be used possibly for music soundtracks or for whatever purpose, but we never considered ourselves when we were making this a band. It's true. None of us were performers and we all were happy with the idea of not being performers. None of us, you know, terribly felt like we would be very we're good the performers. Only, we're the only band where every single person on stage has stage fright. We're just like, I we all started high. Right. You did at the beginning the though. Beginning, I did. We all sort of like hid behind each other until we sort of found our, our stage legs and we didn't know how to translate the sound of that we had, which was a very sort of arranged orchestral sound, onto the stage. We had no idea how to make that transition and it took a good time a good year before I think we really sort of figured it out Wouldn't even care, but now 
comes as no surprise Just leave the light on What I wouldn't give if you could have it all Gary is a, he co-writes some of the songs with me and he co-produces the album. He's an amazing producer and engineer and amazing guitarist and mandolin player. Steve Curtis is a, another amazing songwriter who gets better and better every day. And he plays guitar and sings. And Bob Hoffner on pedal steel and Heather Massey, she just, oh, married, she my just married my brother. And there's Catherine Popper who plays bass, Mark Broder on drums, and Don Landis now playing glockenspiel and singing background vocals. Actually, in our own very limited way, been very fortunate with radio. I mean, I guess primarily with public radio. We in college radio and college radio and, and the non-commercial stations. But we were still sort of like at a certain level of and when obscurity. Obscurity. Thank you. When National Public Radio sort of called us up and they they said that they had heard the record and they wanted to do something. And all things considered, wound up doing a feature. And literally the day after the feature ran, we were number one on Amazon, and it just broke us to a, a huge, a hugely wider audience that we than we had known before. So it's hard to get all bitter about radio, even though when I'm drive when we're driving along and we're trying to find a station that we want to hear, it's you know I agree with you. It's 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 kind of bland. I feel like with radio, maybe I'm a cynic as well. I mean, I gave up on radio in my own listening taste so long ago. And I mean, I only search out the, you know, national public radios or the, you know, non-commercial radio stations or the college radio stations because since I was much younger, that's the only place you could hear anything that's worth really listening to. Uh, our first album was called Rabbit Songs. And uh, it was very much about, you know, being afraid to move on. And especially when it comes to love and just like, you know, not being able to move forward because you're sort of stuck in the past, both in terms of this emotional state, but also musically, we felt very stuck in the past, or we're still, you know, just addicted to this sort of old-sounding music. It just breaks our heart. You know, after we, you know, a lot of us have gotten married and sort of settled down and found, you know, sort of real happiness and love. Thank God, and you know, through no merit of our own it sort of happened so what do you do if Speak you're like yourself. if you write if you're a songwriter and, and your muse is based on being heartbroken it's sort of you know I always tell my wife that she needs to be meaner to me because you know, I, uh, you know that's what I write about but ultimately I just skipped right from the heartbreak to writing about death I figured that was the next logical step just go right to death and then I don't know what I'm gonna do for the next record Three, four. Basically, the only reason I'm writing songs is because I want to hear Sally sing these songs. Accidentally, no, I don't mean to start. And I feel like if I can write a beautiful enough song and have this voice sing it to me. Hey, the rain falls straight. Then I'm not going to feel miserable anymore. That's the only reason why I'm still in this band. The clouds hang heavy in the sky But I don't want to still believe in the gravity of And I sort of feel like when people hear this music, then they also maybe won't feel so miserable. That's why we're in this band. We are still